Hello and welcome to another edition of That Catholic Saints Guy. I'm your host, Brian O'Neill, and today we are going to talk about a remarkable priest, a priest who spent his virtually his entire vocation serving the poorest and neediest amongst us, orphans. And his name is Father Joe Walietsky. Uh, he was a, of Polish descent from Grand Rapids, Michigan, through the Diocese of La Crosse, became a priest, and like I said, spent most of his life helping the poor and underserved orphans in Peru. Today joining me, I have Sarah Siri and Father Joseph Hurst of the Diocese of La Crosse, who is speaking to us from Peru. And everyone, welcome. How are you today? Great. Thanks so much for having us, Brian. Happy to be here. Fantastic, and it's great to it's great to, uh, to to have you here, Sarah. Start off. To tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, looking forward to the conversation today and, and really diving in deeper to Father Joe Walieski. Um, But I have been with CASA and Father Joe Walieski Legacy Guild for about three years. I was working um, for a small Catholic college in the Northeast and had an opportunity to travel down to Casa Hogar with a mission trip, really, and was just captured by everything that, um, that is happening there and Father Joe's legacy and the family model and, and the structure of how CASA cares for the children, their community, and the staff, everybody that is part of the larger CASA family. I was really inspired by that work, and when I was looking to, um, you know, to take my career to the next level and really find something that I could connect deeper with the mission, Monsignor Hirsch and I had a few conversations, and as timing would have it, they were in need of somebody, so I took a jump and, um, and moved into this role, and I split my time about 60% of the time is spent down in Peru, right on site at Casa Hogar, and the remaining time is spent in the Diocese of La Crosse, both sharing our mission about Casa, Father Joe's Guild, and then stepping outside of the diocese to really expand what we're doing for Father Joe and how we're raising awareness and how we're raising um, just attention around his prayer and, and his cause for sainthood. That's fantastic. And Monsignor, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I come from the Diocese of La Crosse. I entered seminary when I was 15, and the se and then I w the seminary closed. I didn't know what to do, so I went back home. And uh, I was an exchange student and got interested in Spanish. And it's interesting because in my sophomore year of, of college, I went to South America to backpack. And part of that time, I heard about a priest from our diocese who was living down here. I saw it as a free hotel. So um, I got hold of him and I spent a month with Father Joe Valieski in the slum where he was in Villa Salvador. And so that ends up being a part of my story. And I've been linked to him ever since 1975. So we're talking 45 years. And I'm a young priest. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> so anyway, I went to seminary then. I, I, I didn't come back to seminary till age 27. And uh, at 27, entered the seminary, and at 32, was ordained a priest. And then I was in uh, grade school work, high school work, in a number of parishes, rural work, Hispanic work, working with Hmong refugees, uh, vocation director for 10 years, vicar for clergy for five years. And then the bishop asked me to go to uh, South America, which I had always wanted to go, but I didn't see a door open. So I was sent to Bolivia to the parish there founded by Father Joe Walieski for six months to, for an interim period. And then at the same time, there was a need here. And then I was sent here. And I've been here now for seven years. But I've been involved with Casugar for the last 26, 26, uh, yeah, about 26 years. So That's remarkable. So how, tell us about this, Father Joe. What, what is his background? And what is it that makes, what is it really that makes him as an example for today's Catholic? I'd like to really get into that because so often people say, well, you know, saints, that's great that they're priests or they're religious, or, you know, obviously they're people who have done just tremendous things with their lives and that's why they're saints. But sanctity is a little bit deeper than that, isn't it? Yes, and for Father Joe, first of all, come, being raised in a poor family in Michigan, 
And then uh, he wanted to go to seminary. And you see something about perseverance in him because he entered a Franciscan seminary. And after a, a period of time, they let him go and they said, you don't have a vocation with us because you don't know enough Latin. So he wrote to bishops, he wrote to many different bishops. Now, there you see that simplicity, that perseverance. And as he wrote, only one bishop answered him back. And that was the Bishop of the Diocese of La Crosse. And he said, I, I know a little bit of Polish. And so the bishop had him study for us. And during his time in the seminary, he made a promise. He said, Lord, if I get to be a priest, I will ask for five years in, the, in a mission. And he was always enthralled by the mission in South America. And he was also enthralled by Boys Town because it was him as a boy. He was brought up with the movie Boys Town. And, mm -hmm. and so there's always been a dream of his to have a kind of an orphanage. Well, after five or about five years of ordination, he asked the bishop for permission to uh, go. And the bishop held him off, held him off. Finally, in 1956, he was given permission to go to Bolivia. And that is where he was given a, uh, an area on the edge of the city of Santa Cruz, a city of 40,000 people where he could build a parish. But we were talking about extreme poverty. And so he had to be willing to live in that kind of extreme poverty. I did uh, interviews for the canonization and I got firsthand stories from a lot of these people. Plus I lived there for six months as, as pastor. And, um, and so I was able to hear a lot of these stories about his simplicity, his endurance. For example, one story that he told all the time is he wanted to build the church. He needed concrete. So he went to Brazil, which is several days journey. And he had to carry a thousand bags of cement on the back or on, the, uh, on train cars. If it rains, all the cement is destroyed. Yeah. So there's a lot of risk. And so he rode on top of the cement and, and still there were people who would come and they would steal little bags of, and, and finally there was a, um, it never rained. And so thanks be to God on that. But then there was a bridge that went out and he had to get a lot of the natives to help Porter carry the cement across the river to the other side. He had to barter away a lot of this stuff and you know, in boats, canoes, and he gets it to the other side. He carries that cement all the way to Santa Cruz. Three times a church fell down. And so a lot of this was lost. And he finally had to get a friend of his, a missionary from, from the U.S., to come and take over the design of the church. And they finally built the church. And so he said, Jesus fell three times. I will call this church the Holy Cross. And so that is probably the most famous of his stories. It just shows how he had to have a motivation that was undying. So he started that parish. He was there for eight years. At the end of eight years, other members of the diocese took it over. He was sent back to the U.S. Spent a little time in Ecuador with the Society of St. Of James. But then he was in a parish in Thorpe. And in that parish in Thorpe, he befriended who would be his future benefactors, a group of them. And in 1970, there was a terrible earthquake in Peru, in northern Peru, that killed like 60,000 people in a mm -hmm. minute. And the people fled to Lima, and they were living under bridges and in parks and stuff. Finally, the, the city said, we're going to zone a, p a piece of sand, and uh, we're going to start a new city. And the bishop in charge of that knew of Father Joe. I would suppose it was through St. James Society. And so they invited him down and offered him to be the first pastor of about 150,000 refugees. Now, how do you do that? Unemployment, it's all unemployment. Yeah. Very few people have a job, and if they do, they're underemployed. You have health issues. You don't have, you don't have schools. You don't have hospitals. You don't have anything. There's no roads. It's all sand. Even when I was there four years after he founded this, it was still all sand roads. It was extreme poverty. And so how does a man like this keep his vocation keep his motivation, and then the people after Mass 
come to him and it just aligns. Father, would you help me with this? Would you help me with that? And so he had like uh, from 71 to 86. So we had 15 years of this. Uh, in 1985, the Pope, Pope John Paul came to Lima and he wanted to visit a poor area and the archbishop put him in Father Joe's parish. And it was, and Father Joe presented the Pope to uh, two million people. A funny story about that is that as he presented the Pope, the Pope wanted the presentation in Polish and Father doesn't know Polish hardly at all. And so he told in broken words and phrases, but everybody's clapping. And he said, the only person who knew I'm a fool is the Pope. <laughs> Everybody else was fool. And so it shows his, his humility. And so, gotta, if someone's got to know that you're a fool, well, it's a good thing that it's yeah. the Holy Father and a saint. <laughs> and that, he, so that's a great thing. During the time that he was at Via Salvador, he gave great hope to the people. And he would tell them, I know you're poor, but Jesus is with us. And if he is with us, he'll get us through this. And so it's this kind of hope that, mm -hmm. that I would say is what made him a great saint. Yeah. He had his people in the States who would help him, but otherwise the diocese was not officially helping him. He only really? had his salary, his salary to work with. It was like $500 a month. So, so he was working with very little to be able to do this work. And, and so he shared with the Pope his desire to build a home for children because they're the future of the church sure. and they're the next generation. He said, I would like to build an orphanage. Now, could you imagine at the age of 62 starting an orphanage? Would you get married and have 10 kids at age 62? That's basically what he did. And so he yeah. had to do a lot of trust. And after the seminary or after the orphanage was going, he, uh, he was fighting terrorism at the time, the shiny path. Shiny path yeah. mm -hmm. A lot of political upheavals and then the extreme poverty of the people. And, and so in, in all that work that he was doing, he, he finally came to the Bishop of Diocese of La Crosse, Bishop Burke at that time and said, um, if I die, the whole thing collapses. Is it all is on my shoulders. Again, think of the pressure that that puts, it, puts on him. And Bishop came down. I made a visit with the Bishop in 1997. It was that visit that Bishop afterwards said, we are now going to sponsor this orphanage as a project of the diocese. And so uh, that, and then Father said, I will need a successor. He said, I have a former seminarian volunteer from Poland, Sebastian. And I would like to have him learn English and take over. So Bishop Burke invited Sebastian to the States, learned English, finished the seminary in the year 2000, just a few years later, because he already had a foundation in seminary. Sebastian came back and took over the house from 2000 to 2013. Father Joe Walieski spent a year at the house here. And then he moved to the jungle because he had another orphanage that he had started in the jungle. He had to close the orphanage because they were trying to kill him and he almost got shot. They would have killed him had he not been in Lima that day. Wow. He had, now, was he, it because they were communists, the Shining Path guerrillas? Um, just so our, our viewers know, Peru was set by a tremendous, a tremendous amount of violence and a civil war uh, for much of the last 50 or so years with these rebels called the Shining Path Guerrillas. And they were Maoist communists. Uh, they weren't even, uh, which is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, even worse than Stalinists, uh, which is getting to be pretty bad in and of itself. And so they're, they're finding, so was it because of these communists that were, they just hated him as, because he was a, a man of faith and they hated religion, or was it something else? Anybody who's a leader is, is, has to be taken out. Okay. And he was regarded as a religious leader. And so he was able to, to negotiate the labyrinth here in Lima, because I think he had enough friends that would be able to insulate, or I, I don't know, I, he was in danger, but he, 
he never had a death threat quite that obvious. Wow. They actually came to the orphanage in, uh, it was 1990, and they said, we are going to kill him because he enslaves children. And so they, uh, they took one of the workers to execute, and that worker was able to escape on the way to the plaza. They murdered uh, about five people that night. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a, you know, slitting throats and all that. It, he would, and Father Joe Valieski was gone that night. And that saved his life. But this is, wow. he was under that kind of pressure all the time. And so, um, so Father Joe Valieski, after a year of retirement here at the house, moved to the jungle. And then he lived at that orphanage that was reactivated. Father Sebastian closed the orphanage in 2003, just a few years later. But they converted it then into a nursing home. And that was another dream of his, was to have a nursing home. And he offered it to the Sisters of St. Joseph, a group from from Lima. And so all his dreams were complete. He, he, he did these things. Apparently his mom had a dream or I had a vision or not a vision, but she, her prayer was, I asked God to give me a son, to let him be, be named Joseph, that he would be a priest, that he would build a church dedicated to St. Joseph and that the mother would die on the feast of St. Joseph. <clears throat> all fulfilled and mother died on March 19 on the feast of St. Joseph. And so father Joe Valieski completed all these dreams. And in the year 2006, he had a saying that he would say, my bags are packed. I'm, I, I'm ready anytime the Lord wants to call. And on, in 2006, he was invited to, with the Bishop, I came down with the Bishop and several other priests and we celebrated his 50th anniversary in the missions you know, being involved in the missions. And we had a huge festivity here at Casugar, huge festivity in Bolivia. He came back and only a few months later got very ill. And on just before Holy Week, he came here, went to the doctor and celebrated mass on Palm Sunday here at the house. We have the picture of him in the procession. And after the uh, mass, he got sick, was taken to the hospital. And the next day, Father Sebastian called me in the U.S. and said, uh, he's just been diagnosed with, with severe leukemia. And that night, the last person that saw him, uh, he, he had a saying, he said, don't worry, nothing ever turns out right. You know, just saying that's the <laughs> way missions are. But that night, when this guy left, he said, don't worry, everything will be okay. And that night, he did his prayers with his breviary, moved the ribbon, closed the book, went to sleep, and died. I came to the funeral. It was the best funeral of my life. Really? The streets were full. We had a 1,000 people in procession, surrounded by other groups. All the kids were let out of school to, to, to be on both sides of the roads. And we got to the church, the cathedral, about five blocks from here. And the people, it was like a victory. Viva, viva, Padre Jose. And, and there were bishops, there were priests, there were religious, and a thousand people. It was a canonization. On the way, I talked to people. And I said, so what, what do you think? They said, well, I've heard of Papa Juan Pablo, Pope John Paul. I've heard of Madre Teresa de Calcuta, but this is the first saint that I know. Ooh. Interesting that they would say that the day of his funeral. And, um, and so then uh, following the funeral, they process back here and he's buried up on the hill. One last detail, and I'll pass the baton, is they were singing a couple of his favorite songs as they were putting the casket into the tomb up here in the grotto. And one of his favorite songs was Old MacDonald. <laughs> all the people are singing old mcdonald as they're putting that was not part of the liturgy not even part of the liturgy plan but it was part of the sponta- spontaneity of the people 
But that's a, a few words, because we can go on and on and on, but about the holiness, simplicity of the man. Very much beloved because of his humility, simplicity, and deep love for the people. That's awesome. And I think that people, you know, would love to just take it back, Brian, to your question about how he's still relevant today, right? Mm -hmm. And why it matters today. And uh, as you said, there's many, many saints who are out there and you learn about their history and what's happened. But with us, Father Joe is today and he is still now and he is still relevant um, at Casa, especially. He is buried there, as Monsignor Hirsch said. And so the children are, um, they're really focused on that in their prayers, mm -hmm. in every holiday and every self celebration, you know, it's it's really praying for him and, and to him up on the Holy Hill, uh, right behind Casa, and he's overlooking all of the children there. But I think there's kind of a few different key aspects that Monsignor Hirsch touched on. The first is the missions. And that really was Father Joe Walieski's focus throughout his entire life was the missions, and that was where he felt he could serve God in the best way possible, and really where he did. Um, and that's how we still hold on to him today, in that reverse mission spirit. So we have about seven to eight groups every year that come down to Casa Hogar from across the US, as well as some different groups who come for day trips or for an overnight from Europe and from all these different places. And we're sharing Father Joe's story and we're talking about what he did. We're talking about that simplicity. We're talking about his perseverance, his hope and inspiring them to then take that back to their own communities, whether it's here in the US or somewhere else, um, you know, on a small scale, on a big scale, but how they can serve God in their own way and their own right by being inspired by Father Joe and his story. Um, so I think that's really a, a big, big piece for us is that reverse mission spirit and how important that is, not only for those in that mission, but also our children, they learn an immense amount from anybody who comes to Casa Hogar, whether it's um, just seeing that dedication of somebody giving up a week or six months of their life to serve. You know, our, our children really can understand and empathize with that. Um, I think it's a huge, huge aspect. And then hope. Hope is another big, big word. Monsignor Hirsch used that a few times. Father Joe Wileski had to have hope when he was in El Salvador. He was building a city brick by brick through sand, you know, with hundreds of thousands of people and um, was the epitome of hope. And we tell that to our children every single day. Monsignor Hirsch speaks about that in his homilies with the kids in mass and holy hour. They must have hope. Their backgrounds are so challenged and, you know, what they're dealing with and what they're coming from, they carry a heavy, heavy burden, just like anybody does, right, in their own way, in their own um, with their own past and their own history, but these kids, it's, it's raw and it's out there and it's exposed. And so for them, they must have faith and they must have hope to be able to succeed and move forward. Um, and, and we really try to teach them the skills and the, and give them opportunities to build a better future on that hope, right? To build a better future and to become better citizens for themselves, for their families and for their communities so that they can become more independent. And then the last piece that really just wanted to talk about why he's so relevant today is his perseverance and entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, that is something that is so inspiring, right? What he did yeah. and just just the story of carrying the cement across the river. Like you think about that today and, and somebody who, who would be willing to do that. Um, there was always barriers in his way and he was always willing to find some, some opportunity in some way to overcome those barriers, to get around them, to get above them, to get below them. And so that entrepreneur spirit, spirit and perseverance is something that is so important. Um, and we've woven that in a lot into the Diocese of La Crosse. We actually started last year a priest leadership development program that is in Father Joe's name. So it's focused on young priests or international priests who are part of our diocese coming in and learning about the idea of entrepreneurial spirit and the idea of perseverance and, and kind of learning and inspired by those themes. But at the same time, they're being taught how to run a parish and how to build the blocks and build the foundation for a parish and for their communities. Um, so really his story and his impact and his mission is woven into to much of what we're doing both in Peru but also in the Diocese of La Crosse and around the world in many ways. Now Sarah, Monsignor knew Father Joe very well um, and had many experiences. I'm imagining you're probably too young to have ever met him um, but you've probably gotten to know him 
through the stories and tales told by the people who are still there who can remember the impact that he had on their lives. What do they tell you? What, share some of their stories, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I didn't have the privilege of knowing him, as you mentioned. It's I'm actually from the Northeast. I'm from New England. So if I had grown up in the Diocese of La Crosse in Wisconsin, I probably would have crossed paths with him and do have several connections and several contacts who remember him in grade school. They remember him coming to visit and do mission co-ops. And, um, and they say he could light up the room, right? No matter where he was or what the situation was, might be, he could light up the room and he would inspire you to be better, to do better. And so on the US side, um, you know, he was really pushing people and really pushing them to challenge themselves for the greater good um, and, and sharing his story and sharing his work of what was happening in Peru. On the Peruvian side, that that part is really what's so fascinating for me and so so emotional and really special is when you talk with some of the people who knew Father Joe, whether it's in the community or children themselves, those graduates from Casa Hogar who were his first kids that came through or the first couple years that they had lived there, he was their father. And they, you know, they say he taught them how to ride a bike. He taught them how to make popcorn. He showed them movies on Friday with all of the kids together. And those are things that they cherish forever. And we have one graduate in particular who has really gone on to be successful. He works at a top uh, newspaper company in Peru. He has a young family. And whenever we speak with him, he is always, always, always mentioning Father Joe and how he, when is teaching his children things, thinks about what Father Joe taught him. Whether it's about the faith or riding a bike, he said he was my father and, and he taught me so much about life and about becoming a young man. And he did that for me and my siblings. So he really was that father figure to so many. And I think even though the children now at Casa don't know him personally, they still think about that, right? He is still a father figure that's looking over them and that is teaching them through his story. And when Monsignor Hirsch can share his stories with the kids, they're, they're getting that same feeling and they're understanding that. Okay, so I wanna ask, and either one of you can pick this up, but I wanna ask about two things. When we in the United States hear about poverty, it's something that we can see it's a conceptual thing for us. We're not really intimately aware of what poverty looks like. I live in West Virginia, so I get to see real poverty. You drive by a house and you think, oh my gosh, look at that abandoned Hulk. Can't believe that anyone ever lived there. And then you see late model cars parked in the driveway and you realize someone still does live there. And this is a place where winter is a real thing and so but i don't experience that in my day-to-day -day life personally so if you could kind of talk about the practical things about you know what it's like to get water or use the facilities or do these sorts of things but i'd also like to know about this we can give a man a fish and feed him for a day teach him how to fish to feed him for a lifetime so what kind of things did he do to help folks in that respect, but also what kind of evangelistic catechetical background did he give them so that they are today, hopefully, I, I pray, good practicing Catholics who are making a difference for Christ in the world, who are bringing Christ into the world. And so either one of you can take that. Father, maybe I'll jump in on the poverty side and just what that looks like for our children, some of the groups that, that come down, and then you can go ahead and take it away after that. Uh, Okay. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Brian, we can certainly conceptualize it in the U.S. And I think there's there's many, many people across the U.S. who are facing poverty and who are struggling. And and it's real. And it's a real pain and it's a real challenge that we don't always see or we don't always have the exposure to. Um, whereas in Peru, I think even if you're not in that position, you're exposed to it on a daily basis. There are neighborhoods and there are communities that are built up and developed in these large cities where right next door, there's a slum that people live with five or six or seven children in one small hut and no running water. And they don't have electricity. And, and that's right next door to a city. So, you know, it's, it's something that I think is a little bit more 
out there and, and forward. Um, and we are incredibly fortunate at Casa Hogar that we have the support of the Diocese of La Crosse and that we have the support of benefactors across the country to help us and to give us resources. So we have running water, we have electricity. Our children are incredibly well resourced in comparison to even some of their classmates or some of the people that live within our small community of Lorene. Um, it's a suburb of Lima. So we're very well resourced and, and very fortunate in that way. And I think it's important for us on a daily basis to remind our children that, and also to remind those visitors who come down of that. So we have young college groups that come, or we have young adults who come and visit. And for them, it's a lot of exposure, right? It's different living at Casa Hogar for a week where yes, you have running water, but it may not always be hot or the food, you don't have a lot of preferences. It's kind of, you know, it is what we have and, and this is what you get. And that's a shift for them. So we have to then remind them and take them outside of our four walls and show them what it really looks like, to, you know, where these kids are coming from and where these kids were born and what they grew up in and where our staff members live sometimes. You know, they live on the other side of our wall and they, for example, we had somebody who works in our kitchen who has worked with us for an incredibly long time and her roof collapsed just this past year. And Monsignor Hirsch and I were working with her and working with her family on try to find a solution and, and find something for them to do. We went to go visit and it was four rooms on a dirt floor that was built out of plywood, right? And that roof collapsed and there was nothing else. And this woman works at our house every single day and works to provide food for our children. And so I think it's really important for us just to make our visitors aware of that, of how far we've come and what Father Joe was building upon when he first came to Lima. And Father, I'll let you certainly speak about that, you know, on, a, on an even deeper level, because you're providing mass in these communities and you're going out every week to say mass with these folks and, um, you know, and just see it on a deeper level than I do even. Before COVID, I was able to get out to several chapels every, every week. Now with COVID, nobody's having mass. They're thinking maybe this month we might be able to start having some masses, but we're under huge restrictions. But... Um, the when you go out into the parishes like this and i'll bring kids with me to help sing as a choir they they see that they have a responsibility in their reverse mission to be able to learn at the house and be able to bring that back to their families and back to their community so there's a reverse mission even for them our hope is that these kids will be able to be strengthened be formed so that they can take that formation back to their house because and their families, because I always say, I'm not going to blame your families for the problems that you guys have had, because I think many of your moms, dads, or whatever parts of families you might come from, nobody was formed very well. And therefore, you have a chance to be able to receive something that they did not have, and you can, you can give that back to them. This, would be, this is the whole philosophy of Father Joe Valieski. And so one would be education. One would be getting the health on the kids. Um, he started a breakfast program in the slums and he got the milk project going in the diocese where he would get farmers to donate powdered milk so he could offer at least uh, some kind of milk for the children of an area. And so he was always thinking of the wider community. And this and that project this, milk still runs today. So that's an important thing to think about again, just tying back to how relevant he is. The Project Milk every year sends us 800, 800 bags of powdered milk that we distribute. We use at CASA, but we distribute across the community. And Father Joe Waleski started that. So we're again connecting back to where there's resources and how we can share them. That's awesome. We only use like 160 bags, mm -hmm. get 800 bags and we share them with the community. That disappeared in two months once COVID hit yeah. because people were asking us for help. But then yeah. the other aspect of Father is he said, we have mass every day. And therefore our kids will learn about first communion, about confirmation. And he says, you have to breathe with two lungs. You can't breathe with just one. You right. need faith and you need family. If you have faith and you have family, you've got the future. And, and so these are ideas, these are, his philosophy is, and his pastoral vision is what I'm talking about all the time. And, and right now, I, we are the only orphanage that I know that has daily mass. 
And so we are, we are continuing the mission of Father Joe. We have catechesis every week for First Communion, for confirmation. We use movies to form the kids, good, solid movies. And then I preach seven days a week with the kids. We have two holy hours that we started. We've always done one holy hour a week, but now we're doing two every day during this COVID time. And we pray for our benefactors. We pray for the community. We pray for the families. Um, and it's, it's, it's just our, our privilege. And I feel our call as we carry on this mission for us to pray. And so the kids come to those holy hours. They can either go to one or they can go to the other every day. And we've been doing this now for eight months. That's, that's incredible. What, uh, what the, that Eucharistic adoration that exposure to the rays of the sun, if you will, uh, you know, getting that suntan, some people like to talk about it. I know that it's, it's not gonna translate well into Spanish, but y- y- that exposure to Christ on such an intimate level can't help but have an impact and will hopefully help them work out their own salvation in fear and trembling as St. Paul says, as they grow in beyond the walls of, of the orphanage. We talk about orphans, how many of them are strictly orphans in the strict sense of the word, lacking a mother and a father, and how many are there simply because their parents are just too poor to care for them in an adequate fashion? Nobody comes from an intact family. There are a couple of fathers involved but the majority are poor women, single moms who have not received an education. They dropped out when they were maybe in about uh, eighth grade or seventh grade. And so they, they find whatever job they can, they make a few dollars a day. And there's no way that you can raise a child on that kind of money. You have parents who are in prison, parents who have been killed, parents who are involved in drug or alcohol addiction, You've got, um, you've got abandonment issues, and then you've got malnutrition. You have, you have kids who have suffered abuse. And so some of them may have a grandmother, or somebody might have an aunt, or somebody might have an older brother or older sister. So there's pieces of families. But there's, there's, you don't ever find a real intact family. And I'll ask the kids, how many of you know, I just asked this the other day, How many of you know somebody who's married as a couple and continue to live together their marriage as sacrament? My grandparents, a few of them will say they're grandparents. That's about it. Nobody in their generation is married. That's what we're saying. Is that a cultural thing there where people just aren't getting married? They can't afford to get married or... What, what explains the, the, the lack of people taking advantage of that sacrament? A, a lack of catechesis and it, very much cultural. It, it's, it's there, but it's in the U.S. too. Oh, of course, yeah. I, I, I just didn't problem. expect to hear that it was yeah. going to be in, a, in what we think to be. You know, we think of, when we think here in the U.S. of Latin American countries, we by and large think that they're faithful Catholic countries. I mean, we know that they're that the Protestant sects are very big in Guatemala and Brazil, but that the rest of it would be Catholic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if we see the the women in Mexico walking on their knees to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, we figure, we kind of extrapolate that throughout all the way down to the tip of uh, Argentina, where we're thinking these are all good, faithful Catholic families. And uh, it sounds just like, you know, when I'm listening to you describe these families, I'm hearing that this is something that could be here in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. But I would say a difference that I find is that there is a piety here that I don't see oftentimes in the U S there's a, there's a piety in which the people know they're sinners. Mm -hmm. There's a piety in which there are, we had the Lord of the miracles on October 28th. That's, that is just huge. And all the whole month of October is the Lord of the miracles. And they, they continue to have holidays 
national holidays for the Feast of Peter and Paul and for the Immaculate Conception and for all, many of the feast days that for us are holy days and nobody even goes to church. They have as national holidays. And so um, there's, there's something that I still find here that I really like, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's, but there's still a, a separation of, of faith and practice. Yeah. Okay. So, and yeah, yeah. it doesn't translate into the practice where a, a lot of times because of their poverty, people just get together. They last for a couple of years because they don't have enough formation. That relationship breaks. Then they start another one that breaks and then they start another one. And so a number of our kids, they come from, you know, the same mom, but two or three different dads. So it sounds like Father Joe, Father Walieski, put in place a situation where that can, at least to a small degree, can be remedied because these kids are getting faith formation and they are being taught how to live the faith, not only in terms of being pious and practicing and having access to the sacraments, <clears throat> But putting that into daily life, it would. Hey, this, this is an important element because okay. you go to many orphanages and you will see that there is a house mother taking care of twenty children. And so it's really like daycare. He said, "No, I'm going to use a model that's much more expensive. I want eight children in a family, and I want them to be led by a married couple." And so. The, the, the couples have to be married in the church in order to give the example of sacramental marriage and vocation. We have right now, we are going to be two families short on teachers mm -hmm. and we need to form two new couples. We've got two couples that are in training right now. I cannot find any couples that are married. It doesn't, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Wow. And so but our requisite is, okay, if you want to work for us, we'll give you three months to be able to get married. But during those three months, they have to, you know, she'll live in the apartment and he's got to live in another apartment here within the complex. And, uh, and therefore, we will model for the children what Catholic marriage is. And that's, it's the most expensive model you can have. I can imagine. But I don't know, how, how do you teach vocation if you don't have married people, how do you teach voc vocation if uh, they've never heard of the sacrament? It would be kind of like you saying, hi, be a priest, it's a wonderful life, and then sitting on your Barca lounge playing video games all day. Um, yeah. You know, what's, what's the point? <laughs> you know, but, I, or if I don't pray. Yeah, or if you don't pray or pray. do anything. I, I'm talking more service, but yeah, prayer yeah. and say the mass and do all those things. Absolutely. Sure. Now, so Mother Cal go ahead. Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of Kolkata, now, praise God, she would go out and she'd find kids on the street, kids who had been abandoned, bringing them in. Father Flanagan in Boys Town did the same thing. You mentioned the connection with Boys Town. Did Father Joe do this sort of thing or were people, did he not have any problem having kids come to his door, so to speak? We could have a thousand kids in our house if we did that. I don't, I don't have resources for that. Wow. And uh, so it's, it's impossible. But we have a social worker. We have a social worker who has been here for right from the beginning. Now she's working at her house, from her house now because we can't have somebody that old working actively during the COVID. But she's, she's been the person set up by father. She knows all the kids who have graduated ever since uh, the very beginning in 1986. And so the people come to her and so, no, we have no problem filling the house, but people, people come to us. But I think it's important based on what you said, Brian, about 
the historical aspect. And when Father Joe first started and his inspiration for starting this was because he was doing exactly that. He was doing what St. Teresa was doing is, you know, he was going throughout the El Salvador and kids didn't have food or they didn't have shoes or they weren't clothed. And, and he was the one that was taking the step to do that. I mean, one of his most famous stories is when he came out of the chapel one day and he had lunch and he offered it to, he offered it to a little girl and a piece of newspaper kind of moved underneath and she moved the newspaper, took the sandwich, gave it to her brother. And he said, why, why didn't you eat that? I gave it to you. And she said, it's not my day to eat. So he was going out there and he was finding the children who needed him the most. And when he started Casa Hogar, that, that was how the first children started to come in. And then he brought on Senor Alciera, who still works with us, his father said, to, to really help to bring in the children who needed it the most and to ensure that we could provide them everything that, that they needed to be successful. Um, but it's, I mean, if, if we were to do that same thing he was doing, Years ago, like Father said, we'd have lines out the door. And so instead, we try to find ways to serve the community and serve those children who still have a need in different ways with things like Project Milk or with Monsignor Hirsch going out into the community and with us still giving donations away when we have them and, and trying to hold on to that, um, you know, to just serve those, those children and those people in need in a greater way. We've been doing the medical mission, or right? not medical, but the eyeglass mission. And so Father earlier had set up this, having doctors come, we can't do that right now. But uh, we've been running the last number of years eyeglass missions where we get people that have used glasses, they organize this operation, and we get several thousand people coming every, every other year. And this is, it's a huge operation. And that, those are all different ways that he, that he had these kinds of ideas. I'm going to go back 45 years. When I met him, he took me into a big room and he said, I got to show you this. He says, look, here's, we have a shoe repair machine. Over here, we have a machine for reupholstering. Here's something we can teach women how to sew. Over here, we have another uh, carpentry. Over here, we have soldering and welding. He had all these kinds of things. Why? because the people needed to learn how to be able to scratch in existence. And so he would always evangelize and he would always teach. He was very a hands-on kind of guy. So it sounds to me, it's a lot like what father or St. John Bosco was doing in Torino, Italy. And again, what father Flanagan was doing in at, at Boys Town in Nebraska, is not only feeding them, clothing them, but giving them the means so that they could go out later on right. and do it. And blessed Bartolo Longo was doing the same sort of thing in Pompeii, Italy. So that's, mm -hmm. that's remarkable. That's absolutely fantastic. Now you folks are very fortunate because you're near Lima and you have three canonized saints there, hopefully four soon, but you have three, you have St. Rose of Lima, you have St. Martin de Porres and you have St. Terribius or St. San Terribio. So uh, what kind of impact or exposure do their, to the, to, for the kids, do these saints' lives have? Any, I mean, is there uh, any interaction with them or telling the stories and maybe bringing them to the, their uh, tombs as a place of pilgrimage? Talk a little bit about that, because I find that really, that would be fascinating. I wish we had today, that opportunity here. We are recording this on November 3rd. Today is the Feast of St. Martin de Porres. So that was a whole homily this morning. And so we reviewed his whole life. The children have been to, especially the older kids, we've, we've taken them several times to see the, um, where Santa Rosa and where St. Martin de Porres have been buried and also where St. Terebius is buried. But we also have uh, San Juan um, um, Macias, and there's a Francisco, uh, Francisco Solano, who are not native born, but they were mission, great missionaries here. So there's like five saints. You didn't so even the know kids, that. That's fantastic. So when we celebrate their feast days, we, we have the kids do that. And, um, and so just like today, we, the kids will, in the holy hour, I read the whole life of the saint. 
And some of our families are named after the saints. So we have a family, it's the Porres family, and it's a family of eight little boys and they're named for, for him. And so for them to celebrate that feast day, they'll do a special dinner in their, in their family. And, um, you know, pre COVID, if we had visitors there, they would be a part of that celebration and they'd be a part of that education. Or if we had volunteers, they'd be learning about that with the family and, and celebrating that. Now, how is it that people can, if they, hear this and they're excited about what it is you're saying, how is it that they can get involved with, whether it be with their treasure uh, or with their time and talent? What kind of things can they do if they, first of all, if they want to know more about Casa Hogar and your efforts there in Peru and also Bolivia, um, but what, how do they get involved? Because this yeah. is exciting work that you're doing. Thanks so much for that lead in, Brian. It's a great question. Um, definitely the website is the number one place. So fatherjoesguild.org, it's frjoesguild.org. That's their central hub. So that has Father Joe's history. It actually has a timeline of his canonization process when Bishop Callahan opened the, canoniz the cause for canonization. Um, and that will link you back to a lot of the things happening at CASA as well. We've got some updates and some blog stories on there just about what's happening with our children as well as a link to Casa Hogar's website. Um, we do keep them a little bit separate just because they, well, they are so interwoven right now, you know, they do serve mi different missions and different purposes at the end of the day. Um, but fatherjoesguild.org is the best place to go to find everything. And I would say there's a few ways for people to get involved. Really, as you mentioned, their treasure, their time and their talent. Um, we certainly are reliant and dependent on financial support from benefactors all over. And so if folks are inspired to give to our work on Father Joe's Guild and expanding his cause and expanding his mission or directly to CASA, they can certainly do so. Um, we're incredibly grateful and it goes a long way in Peru. Um, and then on the other side, prayers. That's the big, big piece that we're always asking people for is if you have prayers and if you have intentions for Father Joe, please send them to us. There's opportunities on the website to submit those and the children, as Father mentioned, they have daily mass and daily holy hour. They are prayer warriors. So whether it is somebody who needs a miracle or there's just something going on in your family that you're really needing somebody to, to put a few extra words up there for you, the kids are incredible prayer warriors. And so we're always asking people to submit your prayers and the kids love to hear about it. Monsignor Hirsch can certainly emphasize that, that it's their way again of giving back and it's their way of being involved to say, okay, this person is really facing this challenge. How can we help, right? What can we do? And, and they really are warriors. Um, so those are some great areas to be involved. And then the third piece is just to reach out to us. We love to talk about what's happening with Father Joe um, and, and Monsignor Hirsch. You know, his schedule is crazy busy from sunrise to sundown. But if somebody catches him to, to talk about a story or somebody comes to visit Casa Hogar and they want to be there and visit his tomb and, um, and see what life is like, we're more than happy to do that and we love that. I mean, it's, it's part of our work is to be able to share and share what our mission is still today. With that understood, um, I would love to have people take, take you up on that, on, that, uh, on that challenge because folks, this is an incredible man who has given us an incredible legacy and we want to support that legacy as much as possible because it's doing so much good. It's bringing, it's being Christ to people. It's not just bringing him, it's being him to folks. And, uh, you know, that's of tremendous, tremendous importance. And, and Monsignor, correct me if I'm wrong in, in what I'm about to say, but if folks are praying for a miracle, they need a, a miraculous, they need a miracle. Someone's on death's door, uh, this, that or the other thing, and they want to ask for Father Joe's intercession, they need to limit it to Father Joe's intercession. Because from what I understand, and again, correct me, Monsignor, if I'm wrong, but if you're saying, Father Joe, please pray for me. Oh, and Blessed Mary, uh, Blessed Virgin Mary, or St. Rosa of Lima, or St. John Paul II, please pray for me too. You can't mix, it's, it's the process of beatification. It seem, may seem like a silly rule to some, but there's a very good reason for it. But yeah, if you're asking for that 
beatification miracle uh, or just a miracle through Father Joe's intercession. It's got to be just from Father Joe. And am I, am I missing something there, Monsignor? I, I think people are always going to pray to the communion of saints all the time. But they're going to feel something that says, I just feel that God is calling me to especially ask the intercession of Father Joe Walieski. And so therefore, they'll say their prayers in general, but there is a very special devotion that they know that if they get cured, it's going to be because of Father Joe Walieski. And so, for example, we've got this prayer that we say, and, and we do it every day now during, we've been doing this, we always did it every Sunday, but during COVID, we're doing it every single day. The prayer asking the intercession of Father Joe Walieski. I've, I've seen things that I would call miracles, but they don't, they, they aren't document, documentable enough to satisfy the, for the canonization. But so I said, that's okay. That just means that Father Joe has to come off with another miracle. We need another one and another one until finally we have what we need. And, uh, but I've had different things that I personally have seen here at the house of near accidents, near deaths, all just so many things that could have gone wrong and they didn't, or when we were saved in the absolute last second. That to me, it's all attributable to Father Jose. I can't prove it, but um, yeah. So I, but if you if you have a sickness or an illness or something really big, you say I really feel that the Lord is calling me to ask Father Joe's intercession. Then write to us, get the prayer card, and start saying that prayer, Absolutely. and be in touch. And I'd, I'd love to, um, you know, I'd love to emphasize that and, and close on the fact, Brian, that if there are folks who, you know, again, want to connect with us directly, please do so and get those prayer cards and be continuing to, to offer up and ask for his intercession. Um, and if there are folks who are capable and, and willing and want to travel next year, um, depending on what happens and, and how both countries continue to move forward with COVID and precautions, um, we're going to be leading a special pilgrimage, the footsteps in Father Joe's, or the footsteps of Father Joe. And we are going to be leading that next July, so July 2021, and it's going to be a week-long adult pilgrimage to really follow in his footsteps and learn about his work in El Salvador and different parts of Peru, to visit Casa, to stay there. Um, and it'll be a little bit different and unique than some of the other mission trips we have with such an emphasis on prayer and, and that pilgrimage aspect. So we certainly invite folks to, to be in tune with that if, if it's something that is on your bucket list, or if you're really feeling that calling, um, we'd love to have you join that pilgrimage. Fantastic. Father, Monsignor, rather, would you do us uh, the, the great blessing of giving us your blessing as we close out? Yes. Please? And then I'm going to show you two pictures. Okay. Look at this. That's a pencil drawing during holy hour by one of our boys. This is, this is probably our best artist, but uh, that's one. This is, this is the philosophy that we're trying to teach the kids. This is St. Paul in prison. And the saying is, it's Philippians, it's chapter four, verse 12 and 13 that says, I know the secret of how to be happy in good times and in bad, in persecution or if people praise me, whether I'm starving or whether I'm well fed. I know how to be satisfied and, and happy and blessed because of he who consoles me. And so th the, this is what we're trying to teach the kids because we're living in a very difficult time. What's gonna happen? I don't know how all things are gonna unfold, but I believe that there is a God who knows and that if we stay close to him, we will be able to get through this together. And finally, I just wanna say thank you to all the people who make our life possible because we can't do it alone. I do one part of this work. And, but I consider it a great privilege. And I think by doing this kind of missionary, missionary work, we become better people and our diocese and the people that are involved become better people. So I'll give you a blessing. Father, we ask your blessing for everybody who is listening. And we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to share a little bit about the life of Father Joe Valieski. We thank you for his, his deep commitment his vocation, his mission. And we pray that rather than just admire it, that we might walk in his steps 
and allow you to be able to shape us, form us, so that we can also be missionaries for our world today. And we ask your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sarah Siri, Monsignor Joe Hirsch, thank you very much for being with us and sharing this, this story of this incredible, incredible, incredible man. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Great. Well, Welcome. thank you for the opportunity, Brian. And, and again, thank you to all those out there who are supporting Father Joe's mission and his cause. Amen to that. And thank you for joining us today on That Catholic Saints Guy. If you've liked what you've seen and you want to see more, please press that little subscribe button, ring that bell so you'll get notifications about the next time we do post a video. And in the meantime, keep praying for to be saints yourselves. That's the most important thing. Love you. God bless you. He loves you especially. He sent his son to die for you. He loves you so much because he wants you to be with him for eternity. So please join us next time on That Catholic Saints Guy. I'm Brian O'Neill, your host. It's been a great blessing to be with you. Thank you for inviting me into your life today. So